Live from New York City, it's the Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. Today, we're going to spend a long time with Professor Guy McPherson. He's in Belize. And he is one of probably 20 or 25 environmentalists, climatologists, who are willing to tell us the truth about what our future really looks like and how quickly it's approaching. That's going to be very important because he rarely does interviews, and he's generally in the jungle someplace, so we managed to get him where we can interview him. So that's today. Also today, I didn't have a chance yesterday to share some insights from Dr. Nozomi Hasey, the former WikiLeaks Central uh, contributing writer, but I will today, an important commentary on From Common Dreams. Also from Jay Jansen from Global Research, the U.S. foreign policy is the greatest crime since World War II. This is from former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark. I thought it was very appropriate. Why? Because with all the comments about how Russia has interfered in our election, I have not seen a measured and reasonable voice on the left or the right say, but we have meddled in every country's elections if that election portends someone who is not in alignment with U.S. and corporate interests. We're talking about over 80 elections, not a mention. Also, if time permits, I interviewed recently Colonel Lawrence Workleson. Now, here's what's new. New information has come forward showing that Secretary of State Colin Powell knew, or at least should have known, that the information he was about to share at the United Nations on justification for invading Iraq was erroneous information. Not simply bad intelligence, but completely manufactured intelligence. And so, as this is brand new, it recasts people thinking, well, Colin Powell was a good person who was misled And he was embarrassed later by his being misled. Now we have to re-examine that, that he was, according to this, complicit and therefore should be held in the same light as we hold Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and Fife and George Bush and all the others. He has an article entitled, We Are the Death Merchant of the World. So... We, if time permits, will handle that. Also, I'm going to be, over the next several weeks, I'm going to be offering some really great insight minds, professors of political science from Harvard and NYU, on what is the left doing. The larger issue is eating itself. It's literally destroying itself. And these are some, they're all left, all liberals, but they're saying something happened that many of us have been saying for a long time. Why are they doing it? And everything from wanting people who they don't like what they have to say to have no form to say it. They're engaging in censorship. They're engaging in the new liberal McCarthyism. Who would have thought that the victims of McCarthyism and the witch hunts would now be the perpetrators? But it's true. And I'll go on to college campuses to show you, A, how dumb they are, B, how intolerant they are, and the really, really the insidiousness of identity politics 
from morons. So we're going to push back because I've had enough of professors, academics, and most importantly, the most mindless generation in history, acting as if they actually know what the hell they're talking about. They don't. You'll hear it in upcoming shows. And so we'll start today, hopefully, if time permits. If not, it'll be tomorrow. We always begin with the latest on health and healing. And if you watch the Olympics the in Rio, the 2016 Olympics, you'll remember that there was the great swimmer, Michael Phelps, and who broke records in how many things he won now in swimming. But he was also doing cupping, C-U-P-P-I-N-G. And cupping therapy has reemerged as a potential approach to boost supposedly post-exercise metabolic recovery, reduce pain, and improve range of motion by increasing local microcirculation. Then the question is, does it actually work? Well, there's an article published in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, a highly respected peer review publication. And it's just out today and took a look at it. There was a University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, and colleagues at other universities did all the research on it. And they looked at randomized controlled trials. What it does do, it helps reduce pain and disability. That's it. They could find that there's nothing else it can be shown to actually do. So... There is some measure of benefit to it. Now, if you really want to benefit after an exercise, there's a lot of research supporting lay on some magnets. I had a magnetic uh, mattress made. I put 200 geodium in uh, 10,000 gauss. And after I do a long workout, let's say 18 miles, and then I go to the gym and do another two hours, I then lay on this. And within about 20 minutes, you feel revitalized. That's because magnet therapy really does work, especially in post-exercise. But it also helps people with chronic fatigue, Lyme's disease, people with fibromyalgia, and arthritis. So something to think about if you're an athlete. Cupping, minor. Magnet therapy, major. I I posted a uh, I posted several videos. I post about all oh, 50 to 75 articles from around the world. Mind you, we have a worldwide audience and I always try to keep in mind what can empower them, what can enlighten them, what can inform them that's not being covered in the mainstream media. And it's about the love that animals have for humans. And I posted a, a, a video last week, it's still there, of chimpanzees. These are not domesticated chimpanzees. These are living on an island. But when a caretaker goes in to give them water and food, they come over and give him hugs. And they, they wrap their arms around him and they give him kisses. And they're showing their love for him. They have a bond. Now, I then show other animals helping other animals, showing the care for other animals, the nurturing. For example, there was a greyhound that had been abused and abandoned, was near death. It had been in, left in a, a barn with no food or water. And so they took it to an animal sanctuary and got it back to health and got it its the vet came in and did the exam, and they fed it and nourished it. And then they got it to trust again. And that didn't take long, maybe a month. Now that animal, guess what? Every other animal that comes in that's depressed or lonely or mourning, this greyhound dog goes over, and she bonds with him. They had a fox. So now there's the fox and the greyhound running around together and sleeping together and, and eating together. And then they had a porcupine and every animal they brought in, this greyhound bonded with 
until it felt great and they were able to find it a home or and so it's just and there was one scene where there's a rabbit and an owl and they're all on a couch together that's that's that synergy of love the energy exchanged that brings me the idea that there's a wolf sanctuary where vets who have post-traumatic stress disorder go and a wolf will go over to a vet and just hang with the vet. So that can pet the wolf and it helps in the healing process. It's not just wolves that have this sixth sense to know when there's something emotionally wrong. All animals do. And I've been around animals my whole life. I have an animal sanctuary. I have a rescue sanctuary. I've rescued over 3,000 animals and got them back to health and life. In fact, as I speak, I have the oldest living that I'm aware of. I couldn't find on the Internet or anyplace else. This ring-tailed lemur is 210 years old in, in human life. She's 32 in her life. Vitally healthy and happy. And all the animals go to her when they want bonding. She has this wisdom of age where she will bond and it's just wonderful and beautiful to see. So animals can play a very important part in our lives. And if you don't realize that they understand what you're feeling, they may not know what you're thinking, but they know what you're feeling, then you miss something. This is from the University of Manchester in Liverpool. There are now 17 separate studies in the academic literature that concludes that pets can help people manage their long-term mental health conditions. And this was published in, in the BMC Psychiatry, the British Medical uh, Journal. And the study reviewed papers on the impact of animals, including cats and dogs and goldfish and hamsters and finches, on their owners' mental health. And they looked at all these different databases, and they found that pets helped the owners to manage their feelings and provided a powerful distraction from the stress of having mental health issues. Why? Because the animal is non-judgmental and it helps them alleviate loneliness in a person who is lonely. If you have a backyard pool or just a backyard, you can actually make an enclosure, even a normal 20 by 40 backyard and you can make a koi pond. And koi are, are Japanese carp. And they come in all colors and sizes. Best to get them small, they grow. Because you can get to where that koi will come right over and eat out of your hand and you can pet it, you can play with it. Uh, they're extremely friendly. And just imagine going in your backyard and just spending quality time with another sentient creature just enjoying that exchange. And people, unfortunately, they don't always appreciate how important that pet is to you. So if you're having some loneliness issues, look at a pet. They can help. From Boston University School of Medicine, published in the American Journal of Hypertension and Oxford University Press, yogurt, higher yogurt intake, is associated with lower cardiovascular disease risk especially if you have high, high blood pressure. And we know that high blood pressure is a major cardiovascular disease risk factor. Clinical trials have previously demonstrated beneficial effects of dairy consumption. I'm talking about organic, non-GMO dairy on cardiovascular health. Why? Because you have an awful lot of good probiotics in there. And when they looked at 55,000 nurses and 18,000 physicians over a 30-year period, it's called the Nurses' Health Study, they found that there was a substantial lower myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack or stroke, um, when they had yogurt, and hence the probiotics. So if you're going to have yogurt, by the way, you can also have vegan yogurt, made from coconut or soy or rice, 
that has the same amount of good probiotics in it. I think it's the probiotics that make the difference, and that's what's important. From Eth Zurich, there is a study where medical researchers often focus upon a single disease. And after you're over the age of 40, you frequently suffer from multiple subclinical conditions, meaning you don't have a heart attack, but you have clogging the arteries. You, you're not immobile, but you have pain and stiffness. Uh, you also may forget some things, a name, where you put something, but you don't suffer from dementia. And I've said this many times, we do not have a holistic, integrated approach to seeing the human being. We see instead, through the mechanistic filter of a reductionist Newtonian view of life, that person is a patient, they have a broken or dysfunctional or impaired whatever, cell, limb, and therefore the symptoms are to be corrected. And I use this on an another level of, of thought. I was once having a discussion with Linus Pauling, and he came over to the Institute, and uh, we're sitting there, the Institute of Applied Biology, where I was a senior research fellow, and I'd done over 160 experiments at that point. And I, we were talking about vitamin C because he was a monotheist. He thought about something, and it just became all-inclusive. And I said to him, I'd like to take you over to the Institute, and excuse me, to the Tri-State Healing Center. It's not far. I want to show you something about vitamin C, because he believed in taking eighteen to 20,000 milligrams of ascorbic acid every day. So when we got over there, it was about 9 o'clock at night. The place was packed. All the people at night had AIDS, full-blown AIDS. All were HIV infected. And we went into a room. There were two rooms. There were a total of 22 people in one and about 20 in the other. And I said, do you see all those bags? They're getting 200,000 milligrams of vitamin C in buffered form. They're getting an aqueous vitamin A at a very high dose, 200,000 units, but it's not your oil-based, won't impact their liver. But the two together synergistically stimulate the immune system. And I said, you see these drinks here? I said, these drinks are with quercetin. We give the same amount of quercetin as we give of vitamin C. So if there's 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C in this drink, it's buffered. There's omla berries, there's bioflavonoids, and then we give the same amount of quercetin. I said, it's the synergy of these. He had never seen a high dose ever. And I said, so imagine taking your concept of 18 to 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day and then looking at what would happen if you did a lot of other nutrients at the same time, not just one nutrient. And after that, I heard about a year later, that a Dr. Jawala began to use quercetin at the Linus Pauling Institute in California. And then I went out there to see for myself, and I actually filmed them destroying the HIV virus with just quercetin alone, just quercetin. And it was an interesting conversation I had with Dr. Jawala. So hopefully, something from that conversation, what he saw, and I uh, impacted him. I said, now you have a physician in California. His name is Dr. Kath, uh, Cart, uh, Cathright. And uh, he is using 50,000 milligrams of vitamin C intravenous with his people who have AIDS-defining illnesses, including Kaposi sarcoma, pneumocystis pneumonia, and putting him in remission. And I don't know if Pauling spoke with him or not, Dr. Cathcart was his name, yes. But here's the takeaway message. When you see a study that says that a vitamin, let's say just vitamin C, at some high dose, inter, uh, not intravenous but orally, was able to reduce the incidence of cancer or the progression of cancer in of the stomach, then 
simply expressing a reasonable projection that wouldn't it also help other cancers in the body, science will say no. Every single system in the body, both classically defined and subclinical, non-defined, must have a separate study or it's not justified. And that throws into the wind reason, common sense, and a more Gaia or holistic approach to the body. We have so compartmentalized, so cut and divided into cubes the human experience that we're not seeing the whole disease, the whole picture. And that's what they're showing in this German study. Quote, as older people often suffer from multiple diseases at the same time, we need to rethink the approach. Humans are increasingly living longer. Interestingly, however, statisticians only predict an increase in years of life, not years in which we remain healthy. These healthy years stay more or less constant. That means that people live longer but spend more uh, time sick, which suggests there will be negative consequences for the financing of our healthcare system. It's time for a rethink. It's true that plenty of research is conducted on age-related conditions, such as cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, neurodegenerative disease. However, science is currently predominantly focused on understanding how individual diseases occur and how these can be treated. The fact that many older people suffer from multiple diseases at the same time is given too little attention in research. So they're saying, when you're aging, by the way, after the age of 27, you're technically getting old. Then you're not looking at the whole person, just individual things, the single pill concept. So I'm glad to see that finally someone out there is taking this seriously. And that's the latest on health and healing. I'm Gary Nall. We're 21 minutes into our program. Back in a moment. Please stay with us. Okay, so your heart broke. You sit around hoping, crying, crying. You say you even thinking about dying? Nice to have all of you with us all over the world. I'm Gary Nall. And in about uh, 15 minutes, we're going to go to Professor Guy McPherson, Professor Emeritus of Environmental Sciences and Natural Resources and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. He is in Belize. And we're going to ask some very frank questions of him direct on the issue of what do you see happening and he is not alone, I'll list some other people who I believe also are capable of being fully honest and fully informed. But there's something happening. For those of us who have been studying artificial intelligence and robotics, there's a disconnect, a major cognitive disconnect. First, that disconnect occurs in parents who are not aware that you're promoting that your children go into a particular school because you went there or because you believe they deserve to be there or the pedigree of that school means something, instead of asking yourself, what interest would this be of your child? What are their inclinations? Are they more inclined to be creative or analytical? You really better understand what motivates your child and what are the child's strengths and weaknesses are because if you do not honestly and openly with your child, discuss their strengths and weaknesses, the strengths will become self-evident, but everything that's going to destroy your child's capacity to grow, learn, and to succeed will be uh, un uh, sabotaging everything else. We like to hide our weaknesses. We, we, we don't want to acknowledge, for fear of being vulnerable, that we are incomplete in some area or confused. So we put them into this whole altered universe where people live in an altered universe, the tenured professors, 
uh, frequently are disconnected, not all, but many are disconnected from the real world and real world issues. Shouldn't you know that if there's a high probability that if you take a simple degree, there's not going to be a job capable of repaying the loan and debt that you've incurred, as, as well as allowing you a chance to get a, the things in life that you feel that you want, like a, a house or start a family, because you didn't think it through. Now, there are some professions that are growing. There's great demand. But now robotics is taking over. Everything that a robot can do, it will. And the major corporations, long before they tell the workers, we're sorry, but you're being downsized and your job is going to be taken over by robotics, years have gone by. They put this into their budget, how much they're going to save, how much more profitable they'll be. And Wall Street supports that because Wall Street says the more value you give to your shareholders, and we don't care how much you give to yourselves and bonuses and then the better it is, the more valued your stock. So corporations are not looking at creating sustainable lives for any of its employees. So we're clueless about where we're vulnerable. But right now, virtually 90% of your service industries in the next five years will be taken over by robotics. That means at least 20 million Americans are going to end up underemployed or having to change their employment status to another type of career or job. But there's something more insidious happening, and it's called transhumanism. I'm very concerned about it because I've spoken with people, it's just like I've spoken with people who are billionaires, and there's a club of them, there's 2,000 billionaires, and there's a whole lot of 10 million millionaires, and they know that society is going to go through a wretched uh, upheaval in the next five to 10 years. They have been working together cooperatively of the best places in America or around the world to have a plan B. When things get really bad, environmentally or socially, economically, they can just get their family and friends, get on a private jet, and off they go. What about us? Too bad. And these are the people who are sponsoring transhumanism. There are laboratory now, laboratories, multiple laboratories, that are at the next stage of this. And we want to thank uh, Dr. Nozomi uh, Hayesi for giving us some of the latest research on this because, like it or not, transhumanism is here today. It's not the future, as I'm speaking. And it also is called humanity, or H. So when you hear the word H, that means transhumanism. The idea is to revolutionize humanity in such a way that they will have an intellectual movement that they alone control. And they want to meld humans with the machine. The machine that is so smart, it cannot be programmed, turned off, or altered. It aims to radically alter human nature with technological advancement. Let me make it even easier to understand. Those who support transhumanism envision a human that goes beyond its current biology and, and cognition. They are trying to move society into the next stage of human development where a human achieves super intelligence and emotional well-being. And transhumanists ask, if humans can interfere with the process of evolution, is it possible for us to create a human being with greater capacities than what we have ever had? In effect, can we make a human being without any weaknesses, no disease, no aging, no anger, no sadness, and cannot die? That's what they're asking. And the answer is, it's here. Some see sex, this kind of technological driven future is, is not necessarily desirable, but necessary. One of those is a big time media star today, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX. Just had that big takeoff, uh, space, uh, takeoff last week where he had his old car. That was kind of cool, you know, playing David Bowie and music in it and, uh, 
uh, on some levels, especially his more enlightened environmental levels of greening, I support that. On cars that are uh, lowering the carbon footprint, I support that. On transhumanism, I'm absolutely opposed to all transhumanism. Because once you allow these people to bring it forward, they're going to disguise how it's going to benefit us. Here's what they're going to say. This is what I'm imagining. You have cystic fibrosis. You have many genetically driven diseases. We'll be able to insert genes that can change that. You have some young children who are not learning at the rate that they could be. There's 30, one in 36 children now has autism, young boys. We won't have any more autism with this. We will have the strongest men in the world. We'll have the smartest people in the world. They will have the total cumulative knowledge of everything that's been learned and computerized up to this point in one mind. So talking with one of these people would mean talking with every Nobel Prize winner and every scientist and every philosopher and every psychologist and every humanist and every behavioralist in world history combined. Could you imagine the quality of that conversation? You're going to be able to have in the very near future, the next 24 months, the first of the sex dolls, the sex men, men and women, who will not look robotic. These are not blow-ups. These are, these are adapt at understanding everything that you need. Any fantasy, any fetish, anything you want, they will be able to supply without anything negatively said. And they'll always be perpetually ready. They'll look real. They'll feel real. They'll sound real, but they won't be. Gee, with the number one usage on the Internet being porn, I wonder how many men and women, and now it's women are exceeding men, I wonder how many are going to be interested in this. Oh, and wasn't there, um, I don't know the name of it, but there was a website that had something I was told, I don't know if it's accurate, I haven't confirmed it, 36 million couples or people who were in marriages who wanted to cheat, so they went on this site to find people to cheat with. And gee whiz, now you can cheat with someone that would never betray you, that would always do exactly what you want, that would never give you an argument, that couldn't give you a sexually transmitted disease, that couldn't get you pregnant. Wow, I wonder if anyone's going to be interested in that. So when you look at how far they can go with this, that's how they're going to sell it. Now think of all those ki kids out there who are now called precious. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, God. You're just the best. You're, you're, you're gifted. You're beautiful. You're, oh, wow. Well. Am I? Am I? Oh, you know you are. You know. Now imagine you had the money to make your kids six foot six and a body that would be perfect, any part of the body. So do you think they're going to have any trouble selling this? No. And by the way, just as an aside, if you have over 30 million people in the United States who are willing to cheat, that means they lie, they manipulate, they connive. How would you like those people sitting on your jury? How would you like those people judging you if you were accused of something? Now, we also know that most people lie about different things every day. So if your predilection is for lying, then how would you know when you've been lied to? And what would you do to look for the truth, or would you care about the truth? Anytime we start off with an accusation, should we start with the idea that unless a person confesses, there must be the presumption of innocence until we can prove guilty, or are we at a place now where it becomes politically convenient just to make everyone guilty of everything without any more due process? No more trials, no more discovery, no more depositions, nothing. Just no matter what anyone accuses you of, you're guilty, and everyone has to get in line with it, or otherwise you're not being politically correct. My God, have we lost our minds. We've already lost our capacity for thinking. So now with transhumanism, we will lose the capacity to even be able to cooperate or to compete 
because realize that only a relatively small percentage of the population are going to be able to afford this, and it's going to be expensive. And uh, the rapid expansion of technology in this new millennium radically transform our social landscape, and the modern life filled with information has placed everyone beyond computer screens and cell phones, and as society has become more abstract, it becomes more virtual, meaning it's fabricated with images that are disassociated with the facts and events of real life. And in so many ways, the recent hype of fake news reflects this counterfeit reality that we're all surrounded by. Waves of whistleblowers in recent years revealed that we live in a kind of simulation intervened by government and corporate media propaganda. In fact, the 2008 financial meltdown exposed the global economy, overdriven by the bubble of toxic assets and stocks that were propped up by central banks with their money made out of thin air. It's all a Ponzi scam of financial engineering, and it was further covered up by bank bailouts and cooperative Democrats and Republicans from Clinton to Obama. They all covered it up, creating a fake recovery. We now have the same bubbles back. This time the bubble will collapse our economy, and it is going to collapse. Meanwhile, our so-called democracy has been one big consumer fraud. We've been duped by psychopaths in power who pull the strings of puppet politicians. All of them are puppet politicians, all political candidates, all running for office. An honest pro-consumer politician couldn't get anywhere today. Why? Because... They're being honest. We don't want honesty. We want illusion. We want bread and circuses. Civic power has been fragmented by a corporate duopoly, keeping the populace in false hope for change in the electoral arena. And with tactics of divide and conquer, monetary elites behind the scenes trigger emotions and stir conflicts among voters in a national tournament of identity politics. And once people are trapped by fear and hatred that are carefully manufactured, they easily lose sight of reality. Rather than finding commonality and building a coalition to solve problems, many engage in mutually assured self-destruction. So while the American working class is distracted by this political charade, the economy continues to stagnate for most people, making the divide between the rich and poor even wider. The beast of neoliberalism and capitalism that has been devouring victims abroad is now finally coming home to roost. Now ordinary Americans are suffering from unemployment, underemployment, homelessness, and lack of access to medical care. We have now in more than 80 communities made it a crime for you to be poor or homeless. You can't even feed the homeless in some places. Young people are burdened with predatory student debt, where despite the promise of college recruiters, there are few viable jobs for them, and social services are defunded, throwing away elders while the military budget gets fatter and fatter by both Democrats and Republicans. So while political corruption is deepening, the crisis of institutions and government Silicon Valley tech companies through lobbying have steadily gained influence. That's not a good thing. And now technological innovation is pushed forward as a solution to the breakdown of social systems. We're talking about Apple, Google, Facebook, giants in the tech industry put a monopoly on artificial intelligence, trying to control its development so to dictate the course of our future. And with the initiative of universal basic income, wealthy and elite technocrats advocate for the creation of a robot economy where labor is replaced by automation. So here's the radical vision of Humanity 2.0 the coming of a post-human era, which is happening now, promises to alleviate suffering and make us stronger, more intelligent, and godlike. So transhumanists try to bring eternal life through insemination of machine intelligence into the human body by combining big data with AL or AI uh, uh, software. The idea is already there for humanity to attain a digital immortality where one can develop mind clones of oneself that has its own life on the web. In fact, I even heard Michio Kaku, 
the theoretical physicists in future share his aspiration of uploading a digital memory and creating a new pill that slows down people's perception of time and drugs that can eliminate painful memories. So the idea of fusion with technology as a next stage in human evolution can speak to our own narcissism induced by social media attention culture. So the H-plus agenda can be marketed by appealing to one's desire for recognition, to be boundless and to attain mastery of everything in life. Through social engineering, it will corral the herd and achieve mass ad adoption. Yet this technological utopia does not come free. It's going to come with a heavy price. I'm guesstimating. I can be wrong, but I'm guesstimating between 5 to $10 million a person. But remember, we have 10 million millionaires. That means 10 million people with two children, 20 million people, plus the millionaire themselves. You're talking about 30 million people would be considered unique, exceptional. They wouldn't want to live around you, be around you, or see you. Everything would be robotic, and they would be transhumanist. Remember, humans are endowed with subjectivity that places them in relationship to the, with the world. With this self-awareness, we are given freedom to determine the course of our own actions. And while machines can only do what they are programmed to do, then they program themselves, then you can't interfere in the programming. So humans with intention can choose their actions and alter the situation through insight and creativity. And this freedom releases spontaneity and variation, making the environment not fixed and not unpredictable. At the same time, out of this comes a potential for errors. And no one is looking at artificial intelligence and transhumanism for its technological intervention on the downside. What could possibly go wrong when you create a person who's now living where they want to live longer and you create an artificial system within them and it takes over and now they can create their own reality their own right and wrong. My goodness. And we're, we're approaching that now. So I've given you a heads up. I'll be doing more in the near future. We're going to take a brief break, come back with Professor Guy McPherson. Please stay with us. We're going to Belize right now and say hello to Doc, uh, Professor Guy McPherson. Nice to have you with us today. Thank you, Dr. Noel. It's a pleasure as always. You are one of a handful. I, I would be remiss without mentioning James Hansen, NASA scientist studying greenhouse effects and leader in demanding dramatic cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. Peter Wadhams, professor of ocean physics at University of Cambridge and the head of the Polar Ocean Physics Group, Jason Box, professor of glaciology at Denmark's Geological Survey and a leading expert in Greenland, uh, Natalia Shokova, oce oceanographic chemist at University of Alaska, Henry Pollock, professor emeritus of geophysics, University of Mich Michigan, expert on permafrost, um, and Bill McKibben, uh, he's an environmentalist, Vandana Shiva, an environmentalist, Wendell Berry, environmentalist, James Lovelock, former NASA scientist who worked on the Viking Mars mission, uh, David S uh, Suzuki, Canadian zoologist and environmental activist, Jane Goodell, uh, British primatologist, leader in speaking on preservation of species, and then even younger people like Derek Jensen, radical environmental activist, and Paul Kingsworth. These are just some of the people who, if you ask them about the environment, they're going to, like yourself, tell people the truth. Handling that truth is a completely separate issue. So if you would, please, I gave your background a little earlier. Tell us about what you see as far as global warming and the most vulnerable areas of the world and what you likely are to experience over what period of time leading to where many parts of the world for many people are no longer going to be sustainable. The forum is yours. Well, I think the 
the president of Finland in an August 28, 2017 press conference in the Oval Office with President Donald Trump. I think he nailed it. And he has subsequently been interviewed and repeated this same idea. In just a very, very few words, he said, quote, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the globe. That's reality, end quote. And he was referring to the loss of Arctic ice, even for a few days. If the Arctic becomes ice free, we will lose habitat for humans on planet Earth. This is quite a statement and one with which I agree completely. We have not had an ice-free Arctic for at least 3 million years. Remember, Homo sapiens has been on the planet for some 300,000 years. And so uh, we, we've never had our species and not even our genus Homo on the planet in the presence of an ice-free Arctic. So to me, that spells a disaster if we lose the planet's air conditioner the Arctic Ocean, and particularly ice, the ice cap in the Arctic Ocean, we lose the ability, we lose tremendous albedo, the, the ability to reflect back incoming solar radiation. We almost certainly start seeing tremendous bursts of methane come out of the Arctic Ocean. And, and bear in mind that it was a paper in the journal annual review of earth and planetary sciences in 2012 projecting an ice free arctic in 2016 plus or minus three years so i'd be surprised if we did get that free arctic this year at least for a few days perhaps up to a few weeks and the consequence of one of the consequences will be such a heating of the planet headed ultimately to or beyond the most common global average temperature experienced on Earth in the last 2 billion years, 22 degrees Celsius, and probably beyond that, within a very short period of time. And I just don't see how complex organisms, complex multicellular organisms, such as Homo sapiens, that depend heavily upon other species for our own existence, I just don't see how we persist through that sort of warming in such a very period of time. So I think looking at, at what's going on in the Arctic, looking at the methane releases that are already underway, looking at the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today, looking at the sixth mass extinction in which we're already part of, described in a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences as biological annihilation words that don't come easily to conservative academics. I think when you add all those pieces together, we're headed in the not too distant future for a world without habitat for humans and not long after that, a world without humans. Because after all, we are human animals. Sometimes we forget about that animal part, but we are human animals as well as the other animals on the planet. As a consequence, we depend upon those many other species for our own survival as well. Just this morning, I read an article by David Neild that talked about something Nature Magazine has just put out. 25 years of data shows we missed something important about sea level rise. Quote, satellite data measured across a 25-year period shows that not only are the seas rising, they're rising faster and faster, an acceleration that we have not seen before. And that's just one of many different studies that are showing that everything that's happening is happening faster than any mathematical model said it would happen. We weren't supposed to have all these fires in California and this prolonged drought in California and the prolonged drought in South America, in Africa. But we are seeing it now. We're just this, In the last seven months, we've had the most rain in Texas history, in Florida's history, the most fires in California's history, the most fires in Montana, Washington State, and Oregon's history, and yet we still do not have a single program at the federal level to call back the scientists and say, let's put a Marshall Plan together and start working on this. We're doing nothing. We're giving lip service because nobody wants to give up their profit to focus upon making industry more compliant. That said... What 
how long does the Arctic have to be free of ice before you start seeing the heating, the methane, and then a mini version of the movie, what was the movie, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, the, where where the, the vortex became, uh, solar vor- uh, the Arctic vortex came down and dropped the temperature down. A mini version of that could happen if we lose the conveyor belt taking warm water from South America up through Ireland and Scotland and Greenland and Iceland bringing the cold water back down. If that stops because of global warming, what's the outcome? Well, I think we are already seeing the outcome or the outcomes from those sorts of phenomena. I think that's already underway. We're seeing the polar vortex which is simultaneously responsible for the seemingly never-ending drought and seemingly never-ending fires in California, and at the same time, tremendous cold snaps with heavy snow on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Those those result from the relative absence of temperature gradient between the Arctic and the equator. A gradient that used to be very, very pronounced, with very cold in the Arctic and very warm in the Arc- in the around the equator year round, and now we're seeing that entire relationship break down. Instead of it always being cold in the Arctic and always being a relatively stable, warm temperature at the equator, instead what we're seeing that is that temperature gradient break down, and so it's warming up in the Arctic at stunning speed. And, and you can hardly go a week without seeing an article claiming that, that climate scientists are surprised or stunned at the rapidity of the change. Well, this is what the exponential function looks like. When we were in the early stages of the exponential function, it seemed as if things were not happening all that quickly. But we're beyond that now, and we're in the acceleration phase, as you pointed out. We're in the acceleration phase of warming which is being manifest by acceleration of sea level rise, by acceleration of the decline of ice all over the planet. According to Eric Holthaus via tweet, it's probably at the lowest level in the history of civilization, world ice, that is. And so when you add up the ice in the world, it's at a lower level than it has been in the history of the several thousands of years of civilization on planet Earth. This according to Eric Holthaus. We certainly have the lowest ice volume through the winter time in North America that we've ever had during the period of the satellite record. And it was just a couple of days ago that the first ship went across the Arctic without an icebreaker in front of it. Think about that for a minute. It's winter time in the Arctic, and we have ships cruising across the Arctic without an icebreaker in front of them to break up the ice. That's how fragile the ice cover and ice volume are right now. The ship can go through there. I mean, the Arctic is the place of these enormous tales of courage of individuals who went up there in the past and barely survived, or in many cases didn't survive, because it was so cold. And now there's open water up there? In the winter time, this is staggering, and I don't think people fully understand the implications of an ice-free Arctic. We're we're almost certainly headed for an ice-free Arctic at some point this year, and even if it only lasts for a few days, certainly if it lasts for a few weeks, we lose habitat for humans throughout the planet, throughout the globe, almost immediately. Meaning that, for example. An ice-free Arctic so warms the planet that we get above the cool, stable temperature where we're able to grow grains. Where are the grains grown? The grains are almost uniformly grown in the northern hemisphere. Think Asia. Think Europe. Think North America. That's where the majority of the grain harvest occurs. And if we have an ice-free Arctic, even if it's for a relatively short period of time this year, I don't see how we are able to going to continue to grow grains at large scale. And when when that happens, we lose civilization, because civilization is based upon the ability to store 
and distribute grain at large scale. So it's underway. We're already at well above the one degree Celsius global average temperature that the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases said in 1990 we absolutely could not cross. We've crossed that Rubicon a long time ago. We're now at at least 1.6 degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline. There's no going back. We have triggered too many self-reinforcing feedback loops. We have triggered, due to latent heat, an ice-free Arctic in the relatively near future. All of that bodes poorly for habitat for our favorite species on planet Earth, I'm afraid. I, and just today I read in Nature, and according to Dar Jamel, quote, a study recently published in Nature brings grim news. Anthropogenic climate disruption has officially ended the era of stable climate that has made possible the development of modern civilization. The world we live in today, based on industrial-scale agriculture capable of feeding billions of people and sustaining their vast numbers of, of humans, is only possible within a stable climate paradigm. The recent study reconciling divergent trends in millennial um, variations in the Holocene temperatures underscores this by showing that temperatures across North America and Europe have reached levels that un, uh, that are unprecedented over the last 11,000 years. This research confirmed the findings of groundbreaking Oregon State Harvard study 2013. So there now even Nature, the most respected scientific journal in the world, is saying we no longer have stable climate. You're saying we no longer have stable climate. You're saying the tipping points, we've tipped many of them. Last question, if you look forward, how long do you see, realistically, even your hypothesis, before major parts of the world are going to see big die-offs of both animals and those who have to stay there, humans? If we have an ice-free Arctic this year, and I strongly suspect we will, then I think it will be next spring or summer when we have catastrophic collapse of grain failure throughout the northern hemisphere. When that happens, all bets are off for the number of people who die in the wake of that catastrophic event. So given the trends we're seeing right now, uh, if we read an ice Arctic as projected years ago, then I think that spells utter disaster for many parts of the globe, including North America, including those of us who depend upon food on the shelves as early as next spring or summer when the grain harvest fails at a very large scale. I, I'm, not, I'm not happy about this prognosis, but I don't see any way around it, given the absence of human beings on a planet with an ice-free Arctic at any time in the past. Professor Guy McPherson, Professor Emeritus, on these various subjects, thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing your honesty, and we'll be doing shows on what can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noll. I appreciate it. And shout out to Dar, Dar Jamail, my friend and absolute courageous reporter, for his ongoing work. I agree. So you heard what you didn't want to hear, but you heard what you needed to hear. Now when I talk about sustainability in the future... To this audience, hopefully you'll pay some attention or you do so by being filled with hubris and neglect or apathy at your own risk. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.